Let me be crystal clear about this. There is no deadline on our work to help any remaining American citizens who decide they want to leave to do so, along with the many Afghans who have stood by us over these many years and want to leave and have been unable to do so. Our expectation, the expectation of the international community, is that people who want to leave Afghanistan after the U.S. military departs should be able to do so. Together, we will do everything we can to see that that expectation is met. That was Secretary of State Antony Blinken just hours ago reiterating that the United States will attempt to get all Americans and allies out of Afghanistan even after the deadline in six days set by President Biden, even after no U.S. presence remains on the ground. Today, Blinken said that since August 14th, more than 82,000 people have been flown out of Kabul, including 4,500 of the 6,000 American citizens known to be in the country. Secretary of State also mentioning that the State Department is in contact with 500 Americans still in Afghanistan and is still trying to establish contact with another 1,000 remaining. All of this amid new reporting from NBC that reveals extreme disgust by officials at the Pentagon, CIA, and Congress over the thousands of Afghans who won't make it out, despite helping the U.S. during our country's involvement in Afghanistan. One defense official telling NBC News, quote, he grew nauseated as he considered how many Afghan allies would be left behind. Let's bring in NBC News Pentagon correspondent Courtney Kuby and Jeremy Butler, a Navy veteran and CEO of the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Courtney, we'll start with you. What do we know about the 1,000 possibly Americans who are still on the ground? What is being done to get them out? What is being done to vet them? How much of a priority are they as we're trying to get as many people to safety as possible? So if you listen to U.S. government officials, they are a priority, but we know very little about these individuals. One thing that we can assume, based on the fact that this this evacuation effort has been ongoing now for more than a week, and there's still these thousand plus people, Americans, who are out there, we can assume that these are sort of the most difficult of the difficult to get to Kabul airport. And that may be because they're outside of Kabul. They may be behind Taliban lines and just very, it's, it's, it's difficult and, and dangerous, frankly, for them to travel to Kabul. Uh, one thing that we've been trying to figure out all week, and we've been asking questions here at the Pentagon and across the U.S. government, is as it gets closer and closer to this August 31 deadline, will the U.S. military begin uh, more efforts to go out and get these people? So we've, we know of at least three times so far where the U.S. military has taken helicopters and gone into Kabul to pick up Americans. There was one late last week, one early at the beginning of this week, and then one just last night. Uh, and, and there have been various numbers. The first one was 169 people, and the last one was less than 20. So the question is, will more there will we see more efforts like this to pick up people who are stuck behind Taliban lines and can't get to the airport? And that's just the Americans that we're talking about here, Jason. This doesn't even begin to talk about the potentially thousands of Afghans who may be eligible to come to the United States to get on these evacuation flights who are stuck and can't get to the airport safely to get on a flight out. Jeremy, there is a lot of frustration inside, outside, lots of people making demands and requests, saying that the president should be doing a better job. I want to read you this quote from Senator Bid Stass. Mr. President, tell the Taliban we're getting our people out however long it takes and that we're perfectly willing to spill Taliban, al-Qaeda and ISIS blood to do it, Senator Ben Sass said. Here's my question. What are some of the complications on the ground? It's very easy for someone in a comfortable office in the United States to say, hey, do what you got to do. They're not the ones getting shot at. They're not the soldiers. What are some of the complications we're still facing on the ground? Oh, there are many complications. Obviously, the fact that we've withdrawn so far and we're only uh, really at the airport, you know, you're basically asking the military when Senator Sass makes these really strong words, as you said, from behind a desk. Uh, he's basically asking the military to do a reinvasion of new parts uh, of the country and to do so without any bloodshed or loss of American life. Uh, that's in incredibly complicated. And the most frustrating thing, I think, is that where were these voices, where were these calls? weeks, months, and years ago. The special immigrant visa process has been in place for years, since 2008, I believe. We could have been getting these uh, evacuees, these special immigrant visa applicants, out so much long ago. 
while we still had an incredible footprint in the country, uh, and certainly while we still had control of more than just simply the Kabul airport. So uh, it's great that people are waking up to the situation now, uh, but so many of us have been calling for this evacuation to have begun so long ago. And it really would have been fortunate if this had begun not only under the Trump administration, but back under the Obama administration, uh, but certainly under the Biden administration. You know, I think a lot of us had a lot of faith uh, that he would recognize the importance of it and would have started this a long time ago. And I think that's where the real frustration comes from right now. Jeremy, I'm glad you mentioned that point. Where were these voices before? I, I'm not attempting to be glib here, but I kind of feel like Afghanistan is, is like an old TV show that, that gets canceled and people who haven't watched are suddenly complaining about it when they hadn't been watching for a long time. They hadn't been paying attention to Afghanistan, and now they want to talk about how and why we're leaving. As a veteran who has served and, and endangered his life for this country, my question for you is, what do you hope to see over the coming weeks? What would make you happy if you were sitting down right now with the Joint Chiefs, with the President of the United States? What would you want to happen over the next five to six weeks? Well, one, I hope that we continue to stay in as long in the country as long as possible to get those allies out. I think we all uh, agree that not only are we backing out on a promise that we made, uh, but we really encouraged not just the special immigrant visa applicants, but all those, the women, uh, the girls that are getting an education, the women that are starting nonprofits, we encourage them to stand up to folks like the Taliban, and now we're leaving them behind. So the first and foremost is let's stay as long as we can to get them out, understanding that the longer we do stay, the greater risk we're asking our military uh, to make another sacrifice. But then overall, I think in the long run, let's stop with the partisan finger pointing, and let's look at the big picture of how we ended up in this place. As you said, the country, the government, uh, Congress, many presidents have forgotten about this uh, war for a long time, and that's why we're in the position that we are. So I hope that coming out of this, especially as we approach the 20th anniversary of the attacks on 9-11, uh, we can really look at the decisions that have been made since that day uh, that allowed us to get to this point.